Hey everybody, it's Mark Patterson back again with another awesome episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week I am broadcasting from my World HQ here in Hermosa Beach, California. And we're going all the way up the coast, leapfrog over the state of Washington and go to Anchorage, Alaska, which I was in in May in route to attempting to climb uh, Denali. But today we have a really interesting guy named Evan Phillips. Evan, how you doing? I'm doing great, Mark. Listen, so we're going to get into all this, but Evan is a very interesting guy. He's a mountain climber. He's a musician. He's a podcaster. He's a lot of things. And we're going to get into his adversity that he had to get through and get over to really get on with life. And, and there's a lot of parallels as I was, Evan, as I was reading your story about kind of what you went through and what I went through when I got done playing in the NFL. And so let's start back on your mountain climbing. So obviously we're, we're talking to you from Anchorage, Alaska. Are you from Alaska? Yeah, I grew up here. I've lived here my whole life. And what was that like? Because the thing that was crazy that a lot of people don't know, so I was up in Denali, which you've been on, of course, and in the great state of Alaska, and it literally was, it never gets dark, right, during that time of year. Yeah, well, was, you know, Alaska, as you know, it really is a land of extremes. In the summertime, at the height of summer, it doesn't get dark. And then, of course, in the winter, the flip side, in, you know, late December, there's only like four or five hours of light. So, you know, it's pretty intense, but it's also pretty dang cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is as beautiful as I've yeah. ever seen and experienced. You know, on my expedition, I climbed with a number of guys who've been in the, in the uh, Himalayas. And from their point of view, it's more scenic than what the Himalaya mountain range presents. And so another thing that a lot of people don't know is that the Alaskan range is 6 million square miles, which is bigger than the state of Massachusetts. I mean, it's just this mammoth thing, right? Yeah. So you got to grow up in that. You got to grow up in that environment. You got to grow, you know, bears and, you know, all the yeah. sea life and all that stuff, right? Yeah, I was really fortunate. I grew up, you know, in a pretty outdoors family. My mom and dad pretty much raised me hunting and fishing. And we have a family cabin down on the Kenai Peninsula, which of course is known for its great sport fishing. And so I was really fortunate. I got to grow up being exposed to, you know, the wild country and the outdoors. And I was not a mountain climber when I was a kid. And that, that kind of happened maybe in my late teens. But I think being exposed to, you know, just being outside in the wilderness kind of predisposed me to that kind of lifestyle. So let's kick in about your mountain climbing because, you know, the reason why we're talking to you today is because of your mountain climbing and kind of what happened. And I want to get sure. into that. So it was around, what, 16, 17 years old when you discovered climbing summit? Was that yeah. a, a field trip or, I mean, a Buddy invited you along? How did that happen? You know, I think I was on like an adolescent group trip of some sort. And we were back in the Chugach Mountains doing like a just a backpacking trip. But we were at a place called the Klutna Lake. And it, that lake is a glacial fed lake that's about 10 miles long. Long, and it's surrounded by six and seven thousand foot glacier capped peaks. Wow. And I remember, I literally remember it was almost like having a light bulb moment being like, wow, this landscape is in my back door. And I, I had never made that connection that beyond those mountains behind Anchorage was a lifetime of adventure. And just a f switch flipped in me. And I was just obsessed with mountain climbing when I was 17 years old. And that's the road I went down. <laughs> so then from when you got obsessed with mountain climbing in Alaska, were, is it one of those things where like every weekend, I assume you're in high school, right? So every weekend yeah. you're like, you know, where am I going and what's the new, you know, mountain I want to climb? Yeah, I was devouring books. I was devouring literature. At the University of Alaska, they used to have an outdoor program, and I did a wilderness first responder, like a first aid training. And then I did, when I was, I think it was before I was a senior in high school that summer, I did a glacier traverse class where we did about a 40-mile traverse over glaciers in the Chugach. And then that winter, I did an ice climbing class. I just couldn't get enough of it. So I started, you know, I got some instruction and then uh, I met a couple of buddies and we just started going out and doing it on our own. Yeah, pretty much every weekend. So did that lead then to you becoming a guide? Yeah, basically when I was 22 years old, I basically just lucked out and my climbing partner at the time got hired to be an assistant guide on Denali. And two weeks before he went, he broke his leg. And so, yeah, so basically, like I said, my friend got hired to be an assistant guide on Denali. And two weeks before that trip, he broke his leg. And I think he just mentioned to those guys like, hey, my climbing partner could do it. And that's how I got a job as a guide on Denali. 
at 22 years old. Wow. So how many <laughs> times have you been up to Nelly? So I have been to the summit three times, and I think I guided six trips. Yep. So basically, it was a, you know I made it to the top with clients half the time, and the other times we got pounded by weather. Well, that's what happened to me last year. And, and what a lot of people don't understand is that you know just to get in a position at that 14,000 foot camp that you've been at six times now, you know, I had to carry, I'm sure you did too, 126 pounds. And yeah. so between your back and what you're, you were dragging in, in a sled going up those motorcycle hill and those other ones, I mean, it's yeah. intense, right? I mean, you got to yeah. bring your game. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to climb a mountain like Denali. It's funny too. I wanted to share this with you, but one of the guides I used to work with on the first trip, he kind of gathered us all the way all around him and said, I just want you guys to know that, you know, if you shuffle all the letters of Denali around, it really spells denial. <laughs> you know, and what he was basically trying to say is, you know, you can be the best climber in the world. You know, you can have all the skills, but if that mountain, if the weather moves in, you got to listen to the mountain. You got to wait it out. And that means sometimes you can't go to the top, you know? Yeah, we got up that 2,000 foot face, you know, to get up to 16,000. And yeah. we, we buried a bunch of stuff up there. And yeah, I was feeling so strong. And, you know, but the bottom line is Mother Nature won that round. And there was yeah. this big, ugly looking lenticular cloud. Oh, yeah. You know, it looked like the Wicked Witch was flying around on the broomstick, yeah. you know, like 400 yeah. times in five days, you know, we're down there in our tent. And people who don't mountain climb don't really understand, you know, the amount of patience it takes. It, it, as much as a physical journey that you have to go through and put your body through, it's also uh, an emotional mental test, right, of all the time and the downtime yeah. and, you know, you're freezing and all those things. And, it, you know, you really got to have your game on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that that's one of the things maybe that folks that would do expeditions like that don't prepare for is how am I going to deal with it when I get pinned down in my tent for three or four days and the winds are blowing 100 miles an hour? How am I going to deal with that? And that takes a toll on people. I'm sure that you've experienced that on your own. And I'm sure that you saw people around you maybe struggling with that. Big time, big time. And, yeah. and you know that even leads to one point more, which is something I experienced in football, which is all about teamwork, right? Yeah. And on what people sometimes don't understand about mountain climbing, it's just not the individual, but you're tethered between four people, you know, yeah. at least at least four people, right? And so yeah. if one of those team members that is on your rope line is not strong, quits, gives up, like what happened to me, you know, it just jeopardizes your situation, your safety and everything else. So, yeah. you know, really yeah. trying to find that right, you know, teammate or teammates, you know, is so critical yeah. in climbing. Yeah, partnership is a big thing, and it's definitely one of the things I talk a lot about on my podcast, for sure, is the importance of partnership. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that word, love that word. So, okay, so you climbed all over the world from there, right? And yeah. it sounds like you were down in South America a bit and some yeah. other places around the globe, and, you know, this is your passion. This is, you know, you wake up, you go to sleep every night. This is exactly what you dreamt about from this first time you went up and you saw those glacier lakes, right? And now you're at 27 years old, and what happens? So when I was 27 years old, you know, the short story is I got injured and, you know, I wish I could say that, oh, I had this big fall and broke my leg. But, you know, what happened is I was rock climbing down in the desert, basically on my off time. This was before I was going to go on Denali to guide for the season. And I tore a muscle in my groin, which... I'm sure as a football player, you know that those are bad injuries. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I basically, you know, I tore a muscle in my groin. And, you know, at the time I was like, oh, I just pulled a muscle. But, you know, I was at the height of my physical powers when I was 27 years old. Probably had a fairly big ego, you know, thinking like, oh, I'm this tough guy. A couple months later, you know, I was slated to go work on Denali. And I went up there with that injury not being fully healed and got up that head wall that you were talking about, yep. up to 16,000, and I started having pain in that injury and realized I had re-injured it. And at that point in time, I was, you know, responsible for guiding people. So, you know, to make a long story short, I had to come down, and over the course of that summer, I didn't go see a doctor or anything, and I re-injured that injury a couple more times. And by the end of the summer, I was in so much pain, I could hardly walk and that was when I first started to like go see a physical therapist. And it was kind of a chain reaction of events over the next year. But I basically developed a chronic injury from that muscle tear that effectively ended my climbing career. Hmm. What a bummer. You know, I can relate to that a little bit from the standpoint of, in my case, I started playing football in other sports, you know, when I was like five or six, right? I'm the like every other kid around America or throughout the world. And I've got a ball in my hands. I'm always out there with my buddies and we're playing. It's going great. And then... 
you know, I get through high school, I'm playing football, that goes into college, goes into the NFL, and then one day, I can't do it anymore. You know, there's this story after story after story of, in you know, the case that I, the sport that I played in the NFL, of guys just, you know, going into this depression, also after college, right? It's just like, you know, where do you go from here? You've been doing one thing for so long, and then all yeah. of a sudden you got to change your skill set. And so many of my friends, by the time I was just getting out of football, they had been developing their careers since they were 21 years old. So I yeah. was now like 28 and like, okay, where does this? So I identify with what you're saying. Yeah, and I bet. Yeah. So what happened to you in, in your case? Well, I mean, you know, you mentioned depression. It, it's funny because I'm 42 years old now and I can look back. This was 15 years ago. I can look back and see things more clear now. But, you know, I got really depressed. And I, it's like you said, my whole identity, my whole life, you know, I was planning on being a mountain climbing guide. I was planning on living my life in the mountains doing that kind of work. And so, you know, it was shocking when it happened. And, you know, I just went through all the feelings. I went through all the, the hopeless feelings. I mean, honestly, I was in denial for a long time. And I think that's one of the reasons why the injury got bad, because I didn't believe it was really happening to me. You know, I didn't believe that, oh, well, if I keep doing these activities on this injured part of my body, it's maybe it might not get better at all. And I don't really know how else to say it. I mean, it was devastating, Mark. It was really, really challenging to deal with. <laughs> yeah, the word frustrating must be, you know, I'm sure it's a light word, but, yeah, you know, what it's interesting to me about your story, it's not like you broke your back or, you know what I mean? It wasn't like an abstract injury. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you can see it on the x-ray and yeah. you can go in and diagnose it. I mean, you're, yeah. you're in this kind of mysterious land of what yeah. do you do about it and how do you fix it? Yeah, which I think, you know, if you have anybody who will listen to the show who's ever been through like chronic pain or something, I think that's a really frustrating thing about like an, an insidious chronic injury is that's maybe hard to diagnose. It's very frustrating and you, you actually start to question yourself like, Am I like making this up in my brain or something? You know, I did a lot of research. I actually went down to the States and saw high level sports medicine doctors. I actually saw some NFL surgeons, like uh, they were surgeons for NFL teams. I mean, I was seeing really, really great doctors and surgeons. And, you know, the best diagnosis that I've had is like, you know, you tore this muscle and then you tore it multiple times after that. And uh, they think some nerve stuff kind of happened and it's complicated, you know? That's why I was saying I wish I could say, oh, I like had this spectacular injury, but, you know, I really kind of just did it to myself over a period of time, you know? Yep. It just got tweaked and got worse, sounds like. Yeah. So the pod is called Finding Your Summit. So it's all about overcoming adversity, right? Yeah. Finding your way. So let's talk about that was, you know, obviously that's a that was a terrible phase of your life that you went yeah. through, but now you're emerging out of it, right? And so yeah. how did that all happen? Well, I honestly kind of feel like I, I kind of had to hit my own bottom, you know, and for me, that was maybe about seven or eight years ago, it was kind of at, at the, the worst part of dealing with that injury. I was in so much pain that I couldn't work. You know, I couldn't tour. At that point in time, I was doing music and I was touring around the world, Europe, the US, playing in bands and stuff. And it was going really well. But I, you know, the injury was always kind of bothering me through that stuff. And it it got kind of bad again. And so, yeah, I, I kind of hit bottom. I couldn't work. I was in a lot of pain. For a period of time, I had to move in with my parents. It would be tough. And that was t that was tough. You know, I was, I was in my early 30s. And for a period of time, I was not able to take care of myself. Hmm. And, you know, that's when I kind of had to really make a decision in my mind was, you know, you used to be a guide on Denali. You were doing all these great things and now you're 32 years old, living with your parents and you're in so much pain you can't even take care of yourself. And I just made a decision. I decided that I was going to figure out a way to make it work, you know, and it's been multiple years of me just kind of kind of relearning how to live my life, essentially living with a bit of a disability. And, the, you know, that's the short version of how I got to where I am today. But I had to change my life, Mark. I, I basically had to learn how to ask for help. I had to learn to admit that I wasn't as strong as I used to be, and I had to squash my ego down a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, of course, very humbling, right? When you're living with your parents in your 30s and you're asking yourself, yeah. you know, where's my career going? And yeah, But what you did something that was amazing, which is you really changed that mindset, 
right? And that yeah. whole mindset just got you to a different place. And, you know, we, oh, I think we all have to do that. I mean, I had to do that, right? And another thing that you said that was interesting was you learned how to ask for help. Yeah. I think that is so key because a lot of times we all just isolate ourselves with our own problems. And we don't yeah. really understand that there's so many people, thousands of people, millions of people out there that are going through the same thing. It might not be your exact thing, but they f- yeah. still have those emotions of isolation and, you know, they don't feel successful in what they're doing and maybe there's a career change and, you know, a lot of things like that. And it's, you know, you need the power of people to really come together, socialize, share, and then have them help you get over, you know, those different things that you're challenged with. And it sounds like you did that, right? Yeah, that's an ongoing process, but I did do that. I mean, I learned how to ask for help, and I also learned how to say no to people. You know, that was one of the reasons, I think, why why I had a hard time, you know, getting the initial injury to heal is because I you know, what I should have done probably was be like, you know, maybe I don't go on Denali this year, you know, because yeah. it might, you know, but I felt so much pressure that I put on myself and I didn't want to let people down. And, uh, you know, that's another big lesson for me that I've had to learn through that is learning how to say no and being okay with that, you know, kind of setting boundaries as, uh, essentially. Yeah, no, that's great. So what kind of instrument do you play? So I primarily play acoustic guitar and electric guitar. And I'm a singer and a songwriter. So I write songs and make albums and perform and do that kind of stuff. That's great. I'm not touring around these days as much, but I kind of have made a career that works for me here in Alaska. Well, you know, I was going to jokingly say the one thing, the one bummer about your injury, you couldn't, you know, (laughs) do the Eddie Van Halen kicks, right? (laughs) Get it going. Yeah. Yeah, I ne- I never really did those anyways, but I used to get pretty rocking on the stage, I guess. Yeah, what, <laughs> what, what kind of music is it that you play? You know, I guess it would be like kind of, uh, it's like folk rock Americana, like yeah. kind of, you know, anywhere between, it's like Tom Petty type music, you Love know? It. yeah. Yeah, yeah, just, I call it good rock and roll driving music. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Really what you're telling me is that, you know, you changed this mindset, there was a, you, you know, learned to play the guitar and some of the creativity was coming back into you. And so now you yeah. start producing, you start writing music. And really that music became, you know, part of the, the tonic for your soul, right? To Absolutely. To kind of bring you back in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's like I said, I because I couldn't climb anymore, I was really, there was a void in my life that I needed to fill. And for me, it became music and creativity. And I like to work hard. You know, I like to set goals and I like to achieve things. And music is a great way for me to do that. You know, we're really fortunate to live in the era we live in with the internet. You know, it's really easy to share music now. I've been able to license some of my music on TV shows and stuff like that. So it's a mindset, man. It's it's just like learning how to adapt and like learning how to make things happen. So on your music side, do you primarily stay in, in Alaska or do you travel around? Uh, you know, the last few years, I primarily am staying in Alaska. That might change here in the next year or two, partly having to do with the podcast. I feel like the... And I'm sure we'll talk about the podcast a little bit, but that's kind of starting to open some doors for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of starting to see that there's some crossover because I write and produce all the music for my podcast. Yep. So all the people who are listening to the podcast are realizing, oh, this guy does music too, and he performs. So I feel like I might end up doing some touring where I do some playing and maybe do some firm line, some podcast stuff all in one show. You know, I actually should have asked you to do this, but last week I didn't a podcast on a guy named Steve Azar and he's a country, it's kind of country blues, he calls it Delta Soul. Yeah. And it was so much fun because this guy's had a number of top 10 hits on the country charts. And Wow. Yep. And I used to see him way back when, when I played down in New Orleans and we'd go up to LSU and see him play rock and it really was not the the right lane for him and then he kind of figured out and went back to his true roots of Mississippi. Yeah. Cool. started playing. Anyways, I did a podcast on him last week and we went through it and we kind of did it VH1 storytelling style, right? Where, oh, nice. Yeah, where he'd actually be playing, you know, and singing some riffs. And it was just a, such a joy for me because I, I love music. And cool. yeah, it was really cool the way that we did that. So I want to go back to your climbing. So you were disabled in the way that you couldn't go back and obviously guide. So where are you with that injury now? Can you go back in the mountains? Can you climb? Are you still kind of on the on the sideline or what? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty limited with the things I can do physically. Anything that's like really repetitive, whether it be like climbing up something or skiing, kind of irritates that part of my body where I got hurt. So I'm really not able to do any climbing. For me, what I would consider really simple things like going on kind of light hikes and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I really can't do that kind of stuff in my life anymore. So 
the way I look at it is I got to climb at a very high level for 10 years of my life from when I was 17 to 27. And during that time, I fit in a lifetime of climbing and adventure. And that's just how the dice rolled for me. So yeah, so no climbing for me these days. Yeah, so I don't know if you see this as a joy or a torture, but at least you live in Alaska, in Anchorage, and it's just yeah. like a postcard yeah. right, of mountain scenery yeah. right behind you. Yeah. Well, like I said, there was a lot of years that it was, you know, I sold all my climbing gear. You know, I had thousands of slides, slide film photos that I took over the course of my climbing career. And I, I kind of buried all that stuff away. I buried it for a long time. And it's really just been in the last couple of years where I've kind of made peace with it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm okay with it now. I am grateful for that 10 years of my life that I got to spend. I mean, Mark, I got to do things that people, you know, can only imagine. You know, I spent my life climbing big mountains at a very high level. And I look at that now and I, you know, I'm just so grateful that I got to do that. It shaped me. It made me the person that I am today. And honestly, I think the skills required to climb Denali and to climb at the level I did prepared me for the adversity that I've had to go through in my life with the injury and kind of claw my way back up after that. Yeah. So the thing that's really wonderful about this story is that, you know, you haven't let a negative, you know, define you. And as you know, you can't fly high if you're carrying a lot of weight on your back, right? Yeah. And yeah. so to shed that, to release it and to embrace it and now be grateful for your experience of those, you know, 10 years plus, you know, on the mountains yeah. and all the pictures and things you did, you're right. There's not yeah. many people who've actually been able to experience on that kind of level. And, you know, a lot of my buddies, guides, and other friends who have done uh, Everest have told me that they feel like Denali is actually a tougher mountain, yeah. you know, short of the, the altitude than uh, what Everest presents. Yeah. There's something really raw about Alaska. And, you know, maybe it's the scale of the geography that you talked about. It's just so big. You know, I, it's so hard to comprehend how big those mountains and those glaciers are until you actually land on that glacier and you look up and look at Denali. I mean, it's, you know, it's just massive. I mean, I grew up in Alaska, so I was always around that. But then when I go down to the States and, you know, see the other, the, the beautiful mountains down there, yep. they're big, but they're not big and they're not raw like Alaska. Yeah, yeah. I was on uh, Rainier uh, Tuesday and I was filming a piece. I saw for, that. Yeah, and it was really cool. So again, it's just one big mountain sitting right there and it's yeah. incredible, but it's not a gigantic, you know, it's like yeah. a bunch of, you know, stacked on top of each other, Mount Rainier's for 6 million acres. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's insane, right? So, yeah. okay, so let's talk about your podcast. So, yeah. you know, you've had this progression, right? You're, you're all about climbing. You couldn't do that. And then, you know, you eventually came into the whole music scene and, you know, you're, you're a famous rock star. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and now we're, uh, we're on to your podcast. So the podcast is called The Fern line. So the first thing let me ask you about, what does that mean? What's the fern line mean? Yeah, so it, fern line is a geologic feature. And so it's basically the line on a glacier where the snow melts up to in the summer. So below the fern line is where all the snow melts and it's just bare ice. And above the fern line is where like all the winter snow stays over the summer and it doesn't melt. So it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, it, it's a geologic term. But the reason why I named the podcast that is because I like the abstract idea walking on a line uh, where you can go one way in your life and kind of make a decision go one way, or you can take another route and go the other way. And that's kind of why I named the podcast that, because it's a little bit abstract, but it's also a mountain term, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't know that. So uh, as a mountain yeah. climber, I now know, right? Yeah, I, I may not have explained it very good, but uh, yeah, if you look it up on, you know, in, on Wikipedia or whatever, it probably explains it better than that. But. No, you actually <laughs> did explain it well. So tell me what your podcast is all about. So the Fern Line is essentially a podcast about the lives of mountain climbers. And basically, what I do is I do interviews with people who live their lives in and around the mountains. And, you know, I, I kind of try and go kind of deep and um, uh, they end up being pretty personal stories. And, and so I basically produce them because I'm an audio producer by trade. I write my own music for the episodes and I basically weave the live interviews with narration and music that I produce. So I kind of craft these interviews into artistic stories. Love that. 
There is another podcast, I think it's Outside Magazine, or maybe it's TED Talk or something, that they do something yeah. like that. And it's it's yeah. it's cool. The way I'm doing this right now with you is very simple, right? Because we just, yeah. you know, just flip on the switch and we're talking to each other and then, you know, send it to a producer and they put it all together and that's it. But, you know, when you put a narrative through there, um, it's yeah. a much more complex process. Yeah, it's also a lot more work. <laughs> well, yeah, so you can't, yeah, I'm cranking one out a week and I don't know if I could do yeah. that, you know, yeah. if you're doing, if I was doing it that style. But yeah, you know, I'm glad you asked me about the podcast because really, you know, for me, this is the podcast has ended up being a full circle experience for me, you know, because, you know, I was into the climbing and then when I gave it up, like I told you, I I blocked it out of my life for a long time because it was just upsetting. You know, it was upsetting to not be able to do that stuff. But, you know, as as I as I kind of went along in years and started thinking, man, you know, I really miss that part of my life. I miss that community, Um, you know. I just was like, you know, I've got all these skills. I'm a songwriter. I know all these climbers from back in the day. I am a professional audio engineer. It's like, I just had this kind of this idea in my head. I was like, I think I could like do this. And I've been doing it about six months. And man, I think I'm having a similar experience as you with your podcast. It, it's taking off in a way I never would have imagined. Yeah. Well, dude, you've got so many skills. And I mean, that's all about the power of positivity. That's all about the power of belief. And that's all power of, of really taking a step back and say, you know, what are my skill sets? Yeah. And, you know, look at in your case and in my case too, you know, you put all those things together and then presto. You know, you've yeah. got this this thing going, and next thing you know, it's just like it's taken off in a place that you never could have imagined. But yeah, you know, and it's fulfilling too, right? Absolutely. I mean, I I couldn't be happier with what I'm doing. I mean, I it's op- the podcast is opening doors for me. I'm getting opportunities. I'm getting to chat with people like you, who I probably never would have gotten to chat with. Well, let's just be truth be told here. So I found you on my Instagram or through Instagram. So I have an Instagram account, account NFL27 Summits, and, and somehow or another you came up or I found you like mountain. So I started stalking you and there's just all these amazing pictures, mostly of Alaska, right? Yeah. And, and I think I'm like, what, what's this whole thing about Fernline? And so that's how I, I reached out to you and that's, I think, how the conversation going. And so, you yeah. know, well, so I'll return the favor to you saying it's a treat for me to meet somebody with your kind of skill set and, you know, what you've been able to experience to share back on, you know, not just that you're a mountain climber, but, you know, you ran into some friction where you couldn't yeah. do what you wanted to do. And that was your that was your passion, you know. Yeah. And here you are today in this wonderful spot. It's great. Yeah, life's good and life is always getting better. And um yeah, I'm just like I said, I'm just grateful for the opportunities that I'm that I'm getting. And, you know, and at the same time, I'm also aware that that it has come because of hard work and commitment too. you know, and I know you know that, you know, being an NFL football player and probably the other things you've done in your life. I mean, people have no idea the work that goes on behind the scenes to, you know, when you make things happen in your life, it's it doesn't just happen. It happens because there's a lot of work and there's a day to day commitment. You know, and I, I, I just, I respect that. I really try and live my life that way. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, boy, I've had a lot of that come my way where they go, hey, you're just lucky, you, you know, the you cut the last second touchdown or whatever it might be. And, <laughs> you know, they, I was like, you have no idea the amount of nights I spent running those stairs in the rain yeah. when nobody was around and it was pitch black, right? Yeah. And so you're hungry. Like, you're hungry and you set up perfectly about the discipline and the rituals and the consistency and the hard work that you have to put in yeah. to make something happen. Yeah. So where can people find you? Well, if you want to check out my music... The music side of what I do, you can check me out at evanphillips.net, and you, there's links to all my albums and uh, all the music stuff I do. And then if you want to check out the Fernline podcast, the website is thefernline.com, and that's F-I-R-N-L-I-N-E, the Fernline. And I'm on iTunes and all that stuff, too. So Okay. Yeah. Or you can just Google Evan Phillips, Alaska, and all sorts of stuff will pop up. <laughs> there, there's no like grizzly bear attacks or anything on you. <laughs> <laughs> no. We're, we're good there? No. Yeah, we're good there. I don't want to freak yeah. people out. Yeah, so we will um, also have show notes on this too, so people can yeah, see. Yeah, cool. On, cool. on all the different links that you have. So it's all good. So listen, Evan, thank you so much for being on the show. We continue to get just rock stars like you and it's, it's fun to, you know, interview and find and learn and, you know, how you found your way into a very successful life. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. 
And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on MarkPattisonNFL.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.